Thank you, uh, Sir David. I am afraid on this occasion I will disappoint the Honourable Member for Edinburgh uh, uh, South because I will speak for more than 90 uh, seconds. I also, uh, during uh, uh, this uh, debate, very much uh, enjoyed hearing full uh, contributions rather than uh, just uh, interventions from member for uh, Ross Sky and Loch Arbour, although the length was probably not that, not that different. Uh, uh, the Honourable Lady from Ayrshire and Aaron uh, gave a spirited contribution. I did not recognise myself, I have to say, in her uh, uh, description, and uh, the Honourable Gentleman from Edinburgh. East. Uh, we are in agreement on so many uh, things that are just bits that uh, spoil it uh, uh, in, in the contribution. But I do trust the Scottish Parliament. I want the Scottish Parliament uh, to be making significant, making significant uh, decisions in relation to welfare, unimpeded by uh, the views of uh, the UK government. And whatever uh, we may come to, to, to debate, and I'll say a, a bit more about section 25.3, there is no restriction on the policy decisions of the Scottish uh, uh, Government and Parliament in relation uh, to those provisions. It is an issue uh, about timing. Now, what I want to say more widely in relation to uh, uh, the, the point uh, that he made in relation to a, uh, the, the consideration uh, of amendments is that I am uh, and have said throughout that I am reflecting on points made throughout uh, these uh, debates and uh, discussions. It is an undertaking I, ha I have not just given to this Parliament, but I have given to the uh, Devolution for Other Powers Committee, and indeed it is an undertaking that I have given to the Scottish Government. And, uh, if, if we want to do selective quotes from uh, Mr Swinney's uh, letter, I will give you a, uh, the, the quote that, that I think sums the situation up. When we met on 25th June, we agreed on a programme of work to be undertaken before a report stage with a view to producing a bill that reflected the Smith Commission, the concerns of stakeholders and the views of the Scottish Parliament. And that is absolutely my position. And I uh, am committed uh, to work uh, with the Deputy First Minister in that regard. Do you not accept, if you read further in the letter, that the Deputy First Minister is concerned that that process is not going to happen? And he, like us, the rest of us here, are marvelling at the fact that after four days' debate, you won't accept one single line of one single amendment that yeah, yeah. has been put before you. I, I, th I think I've, I've set out. Actually, I think you've got the order of the uh, letter wrong, because what Mr Swinney says, if that doesn't happen, then uh, obviously it, it, the, 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 the situation uh, or the undertaking that being, being given uh, wouldn't be valid. And of course that's uh, correct. But that my approach to this bill is to take it forward on a basis that it fully reflects the Smith Commission uh, proposals, that it takes account of concerns and issues that are being raised. Now, obviously, a number of amendments that are being brought forward, and I, I, I believe sincerely, uh, although I do not agree with them by uh, SNP members, are, are what might be described uh, as Smith a uh, plus, and, and we're listening uh, to the points that are being made in regard uh, to those uh, amendments. But we're also listening, in respect of what everyone uh, is saying, in relation to the bill as it stands in reflecting Smith. And of course, I have appeared myself before the devolved uh, powers committee, and we've had a lengthy discussion, had a lengthy discussion about the, cla the clauses that have been the subject of uh, debate to de today. And I expect to have further such discussions with that committee, and there will of course be further uh, debate and discussion uh, in this. Uh, Parliament. Now, a lot of what is said, Sir David, in uh, these uh, discussions is predicated on a view that the Scottish Government and the UK Government are always at odds, and that is just quite simply not the case, and is something that should not be uh, given a common uh, currency. On 90 per cent of issues, uh, the UK and government, Scottish Government work very, very closely together for the benefit of the people of Scotland. And, 
on very serious issues uh, ongoing at this moment. There is very, very close working and absolutely no issues, no need to resort to external processes uh, of review. The Smith process agreed a shared uh, response for welfare. And I think that what Smith shows is that we have to have a new mindset. That, to me, is what the spirit of the Smith Commission is. It's about working together in a shared space, and having the commitment to doing that is just as important as anything that's on the face of uh, the bill. And whilst I always find the Honourable uh, Lady for uh, Banff and Buchan to be extremely passionate on these issues, and actually, to be a re uh, actually generally to be a reasonable person until she stands up uh, in this, uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, chamber, but the way in which the way in which she portrays the relations between the two governments is just not correct. We have established a joint ministerial working group uh, on welfare, and, and last Thursday I also met uh, uh, with uh, Alec Neil. We will no doubt have a letter about that meeting, but I also met with Alec Neil as the transitional uh, arrangements and the next meeting of the joint uh, ministerial group on welfare and, we, welfare, and we have found these discussions to, to be very productive, producing a lot of good work on the transition uh, of uh, the powers and the establishment of processes in Scotland. And I don't see uh, any reason to believe that that uh, can't continue. It's what people in Scotland want. That's what they want. They want these two parliaments to work together. They want the two uh, governments to work together. And they don't want to see constant uh, bickering. And that's my uh, determined effort to ensure that that's not the case, that we can deliver a, a process. Now, I'm uh, very conscious of the views of charities and voluntary uh, organisations, and I respect those views and take them uh, into uh, account, just as I have said that I take into account. That I take into account uh, uh, indeed. If uh, the Secretary of State is indeed listening to Civic Scotland, to third sector organisations, uh, and to the Scottish Government and uh, these benches, uh, will he advise which of the amendments put forward by these benches and by uh, the Labour benches uh, he will be accepting? Well, I will read out uh, what I, I said in my, my previous uh, uh, a, a comment that uh, I have agreed a programme of work to be undertaken before the report stage with a view to producing a bill that reflects the Smith Commission, the concerns of stakeholders and the views of the Scottish Parliament. And, I, and in that case, I will reflect on the amendments that have been uh, brought forward and the case that have been made for those amendments. And I, am, uh, and I give this undertaking. I am listening in relation to what has been said in relation uh, to Clause uh, 20. Uh, 53e. I see it as a sensible uh, consultation requirement uh, about timing, not about policy. A good governance in Scotland uh, will require that such decisions taken by the Scottish Government in relation to new powers can be implemented in a timeliest way. And uh, that's what it's about. It's about respect within a shared space, and it's about working together in relation uh, to a uh, welfare. Bef yeah. Mr. Ian Mark. Grateful to the Secretary of State, but on that particular point, could you give the House a practical example of a policy that the Scottish Government may bring forward that may have a delivery mechanism through the Department of Work and Pensions, so we can be clear and trust that what the Secretary of State is saying is actually correct, and there is not an effective veto. Secretary of State. I do not yet know what proposals the, the Scottish Government will uh, bring forward. Now, I, I mean, I have made that very clear that I would like to know uh, what, what proposals the Scottish Government have, because we have had you know, very significant criticisms of, the, of, of, the, of UK Government policy. That is legitimate within uh, this Parliament, indeed within uh, the Scottish Parliament. But we need to know uh, what the detail is. In the discussions that we have in the Joint Ministerial Group on Welfare, we want to understand where the Scottish Government want to go in relation to specific uh, programmes so that we can actually help and facilitate 
the transitional uh, arrangements so that we can actually deliver what it is that they want to do. Because I want them to be held to account. I don't want to be in a situation as we are in this Parliament where people stand up and make grand statements but are not accountable for them, don't tell anybody where the money is going to come from or how the, how the systems are going to work in practice. And a lot of us who live in Scotland see that all the things that the Scottish Government says sometimes don't actually happen in reality. Shock, uh, horror. So I uh, want to see a system where the Scottish Government is accountable, where they have these powers on welfare and where they have a, a situation where they have to set out for the people of Scotland how much their policies are going to cost and where uh, the money is uh, going to come from. Uh, can I just uh, comment on my uh, honourable friend's a, uh, a amendment, uh, the, the member for Gainsborough, who a, I, I think I said in uh, one of the previous debates was indeed the 57th, and in, today he proves uh, the case by bringing forward an even an even stronger amendment uh, yet again on a matter uh, uh, that, that the SNP have uh, said uh, was their policy. I mean, it is a fact that no Scottish MP has tabled an amendment to devolve UK pensions, and I think that speaks volumes. It tells us that even the supporters of independence accept that there are parts of welfare where it makes sense to share resources and risks with the rest of the UK. It is clear that pensions are safer and more affordable if we work with everyone else in the UK and that it would be wrong to devolve UK pensions. MPs have to respect the referendum result where people in Scotland voted to remain part of the United Kingdom and hold on to the benefits of being part of that UK. Looking after the people of Scotland who are retired, unwell or out of work is now a shared space where the UK Government and Scottish Governments need to work uh, together. It is about getting the right balance and having the best of both worlds. Sometimes it will be right for people in Cumbernauld to know that they have exactly the same protection and support as people in Cardiff and Carlisle. On other occasions, the Scottish Parliament may want to offer different help for people in Scotland using the taxes that have been raised in Scotland. Turning specifically to uh, the amendments that the uh, member for Edinburgh uh, South uh, brought forward, I do not uh, share his views and, and do not believe he made the case in relation to uh, childcare. I want to comment, though, a bit more in detail in what he had to say in relation to new clause uh, 20. Eight, which was uh, an issue that, that has been uh, raised uh, previously. The Scottish Government already has competence to work with all housing sectors in Scotland to support and encourage new builds. Indeed, the Scottish Government has been very active in heralding its affordable housing supply programme, which ranges across all different types of tenure. The Scottish Government also has the ability to regulate the private rental market and, I believe, has been active in this area. The, Scot the Housing Scotland uh, Act 2014 included a number of provisions to deal with what might be classed as standards of housing in the private sector, such as powers for local authorities to tackle disrepair in that sector. As regards funding, honourable members no doubt realise that housing benefit is paid to claimants for express purposes of meeting individuals' housing costs where the eligibility rules are met. Because it covers rent at a point in time, there, could, there would be no margin from which to create a housing building investment fund from housing benefit. However, we have already heard how the powers in the Bill will give Scottish Ministers flexibility over housing costs within universal credit. This flexibility could be used to reduce housing costs for renters should Scottish Ministers wish in order to generate funding they could spend on other areas of housing should they so wish. There is no need for housing benefit to be devolved to allow this. Such a fund would also require appropriate powers to be put in place. It was also interesting uh, to hear uh, the Honourable Member's assumptions about the amount of money that would be available for investment in housing. $1.8 billion was quoted. This equates to the total amount of housing benefit expenditure in Scotland, which appears to suggest that Honourable Members are saying that housing benefit should be abolished in Scotland. I'm sure that's not what their intention was. 
Assuming that this is not really what was intended, the amendment could still have serious consequences for Scottish landlords, both social sector landlords and private sector ones. Honourable members need to think carefully about the implications for business of the viability of housing and the viability of housing associations and private landlords. Housing benefit is a payment towards the rental liabilities of people on benefits. It is not intended to fund the expansion of housing stock. Mr. Amar. I am grateful to the Secretary of State for that particular uh, explanation, but the point that he is missing is there is no incentive for either local government or the Scottish Government to build new affordable homes because the housing bill comes from a different government. It comes from the UK Government. So by devolving the responsibility for housing, ben- housing benefit, you are devolving the responsibility and accountability to build more affordable and social homes. Secretary of State. I think it is a matter for his and my colleagues uh, to raise within the Scottish Parliament and to hold the Scottish Government to account. Uh, for uh, their uh, housing uh, policies. Uh, his amendment also carries with it uh, not insignificant uh, costs, and what appears to be a simple proposition uh, is very far uh, from uh, the case. Um, I will not be able to uh, recommend acceptance of uh, that amendment. However, uh, as I have indicated, I am reflecting on all uh, amendments that are are, uh, brought forward. My position is to move as quickly as possible to achieve the devolution of these significant welfare powers uh, to the Scottish Parliament so that we can move on and have a proper and mature debate in Scotland about how these powers are going to be used and who is going to pay the cost of additional uh, benefits uh, should those, those be proposed by a future Scottish Government. On that basis, I uh, move the clauses as stated. Dr Ailey Whiteford. Thank you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Crosby. We have had a, a very interesting and I think very interesting and I think wide ranging debate on these amendments this afternoon. Perhaps more uh, wide ranging than I could ever have envisaged. I'm not sure how we managed to get sidetracked into Greece so early on in the afternoon's debate. It did seem, if I may say so, a rather ill conceived comparison between Greece and Scotland yeah. uh, that was made, but it was of course refuted very ably and rather comprehensively by uh, the honourable friend, the honourable member for Gainsborough. But however different Scotland and Greece may be in cultural, economic and indeed climactic terms, uh, the thing that I, I won't give away just at the moment, I think we've talked quite enough about Greece, but I want to make a couple of substantive points on the issues that were raised. Uh, Whatever uh, we we might have as differences, what we do have in common, apart from our patron saint, is that uh, people in Scotland, I think, will be in great sympathy with their fellow European citizens in Greece and indeed have a sense of solidarity at the level of deprivation that they are having to undergo at the minute. But it was my honourable friend from Nanielan Year, who is not here at the moment, who I think made the important point that the real morality tale from the Greek situation that is very relevant to our discussions today is that austerity doesn't work and that we need the power to create alternatives to it. I think the other salutary tale that we heard this afternoon in the chamber came from the honourable member for for Foyle, who with his usual eloquence uh, drew on his experiences in Northern Ireland to warn of the difficulties ahead if we fail to legislate clearly. He also warned of the dangers of what has rather prosaically been termed in Northern Ireland karaoke legislation, where people have the powers but not the power to enforce the powers. My honourable friend from Ross, Sky and Lochaber made a powerful speech that highlighted some of the real differences in the challenges uh, we are facing in Scotland in relation to welfare and pensions from other parts of the UK, pointing out that low life expectancy and Uh, the poor value that Scottish pensioners get, and indeed we have some of the lowest pensions in Europe, and Scottish pensioners end up uh, around £10,000 each uh, worse off because of our current pension arrangements. My honourable friend from North Ayrshire and Arran drew attention to the issues around the work allowance, a really good example of what we might do with these powers uh, to improve the support that we give to uh, lower paid workers. But above all, um, we need to talk about the veto. My honourable friend from Edinburgh East, who is quickly becoming one of the stars of this Parliament, uh, set out how uh, new clauses 45 and 46 would enable constructive working between the UK and Scottish governments. Not just fine words about constructive working, but actual fine working. And of course, uh, moving to the front benches, the member for Edinburgh uh, South, I very much welcome his support for our lead amendment today uh, and for Amendment 119. I listened very carefully to the Secretary of State's 
uh, conclusion of, of the debate. And, you know, I fully accept that there are constructive relationships uh, through the Joint Ministerial Working Group and many other parts of the Scottish and UK Government. But when there are genuine differences of opinion and differences of ideological direction uh, and different policies, different circumstances, we need the mechanisms and we need the legislation that enables us to deal with those effectively. And that's what we still don't see on the face of this bill. Uh, the problem is that this bill, in its current form, just doesn't cut the mustard, frankly. And I, I think the Secretary of State's position on this could probably be summed up by the old saying, there are out of step but who are jock, because there's a consensus in Scotland, there's a consensus from all the other Scottish MPs, from our MSPs, including the MSPs of his own party, oh, and from civil society in Scotland, that these, this veto needs to uh, be taken out of this bill. Yeah. So I would urge uh, the Secretary of State really to listen. Uh, Part of, of the problem I think we've had in Scotland for too long is that people have not been listening. Yep. And the voices of the people of Scotland will not be silenced. Yeah. Uh, and you know, if the Secretary of State thinks that these issues are going to go away, they're not. And I think we've got salutary lessons on why we need to have that legislation pinned down and secured. So, I, earlier in the debate, I should have uh, also moved uh, new clauses 39 and 40, and I'm grateful to the member for uh, Edinburgh South for. Uh, flagging up my omission in that. We will push, I'm just summing up, uh, that we will push uh, new clause 39 to a vote later. Uh, in the meantime, I would also indicate that we'd like to push uh, uh, Amendment 118, our lead amendment today, to a vote at this time. The question is that Amendment 118 be made. As many as aren't that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. Division. Clear the lobbies. Order, order. The eyes to the right, 261. The nose to the left, 313. The eyes to the right were 261. The nose to the left were 313. I think the nose have it. The nose have it. Unlock the doors. The question is that clause 24 stand part of the bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that clause 25 stand part of the bill. As many as are of that opinion say that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. <laughs>